Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this webinar brought to you by City Index. My name is James Chen. I'm the Chief Technical Strategist at City Index Group. Uh, today we're going to be talking about emotions and trading psychology. I'm also going to be talking about uh, uh, other aspects of trading as well. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, a strategy perspective and then I'm going to go into money management and then I'm going to go all over the uh, trading psychology and emotional pitfalls. And then I'm going to show you on my charts uh, exactly what I'm looking at uh, in terms of uh, several of the different markets that I'm uh, watching on a daily basis. Uh, this is part of our Wednesday series, uh, our ongoing education series uh, regarding trading in uh, the financial markets. And uh, let's get started real quick. Uh, I uh, encourage you, if you have any questions during the course of this uh, webinar, please feel free to uh, type them into the questions window. This is not meant to be a one-sided conversation. If you have any questions whatsoever, I'd love to uh, answer them and uh, see if we could uh, discuss uh, any questions or concerns you may have. Okay, so uh, let's get started very quickly here. First off, as always, just a quick uh, disclaimer. Risk warning, financial trading carries a high level of risk to your capital with the possibility of losing more than your initial investment and may not be suitable for all investors. Ensure that you fully understand the risks involved and seek investment advice if necessary. Okay, first of all, if you, if you guys can hear me, uh, if you could just type in yes into the window, that would be great, into the questions window. Okay, great. Okay, so let's get started uh, real quick here. I see uh, you could all hear me and you could uh, see my slides here. Uh, let's get started uh, very quickly about me. Uh, actually, I'm not going to really go through this. I think uh, most of you know by now. Uh, who I am. We have this uh, long series, uh, ongoing series of educational webinars that have all been recorded, uh, including this one, which will be posted uh, tomorrow. And you'll be able to see, uh, you know, if you've missed anything or if you came later or, or what have you. So uh, all of our webinars are recorded and placed on our website uh, for later viewing. So feel free to do that. Um, just again, my name is James Chen. I'm the Chief Technical Strategist at City Index Group, which means uh, what I do on a daily basis is I trade the markets, I analyze the markets, and I educate much, much like what I'm doing right now. Okay, so let's get into it real quick. Uh, in terms of this uh, ongoing uh, Wednesday series of webinars uh, at 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, UK time, um, we've done a lot of uh, different... Um, a lot of different subjects and, and topics regarding trading. Now, I just wanted to address one thing. A lot of you may have, or some of you, uh, may have been thinking, especially on my last uh, webinar, that uh, I wasn't actually uh, providing any concrete strategy. Well, the the uh, you know the main idea of this series of webinars is to provide a holistic view, a holistic perspective of uh, of trading, and uh, I do provide concrete strategies on uh, many of my webinars, as I've done in the past, and I will continue to do into the future. Uh, last week's webinar was uh, purely about exits, okay, about taking profits, about, uh, about uh, protecting your downside, your losses, risk management, etc. Uh, it wasn't necessarily about a concrete, uh, you know, strategy for getting in and out of the markets. And I've done many of these webinars before, uh, and again, you could see them on our website, uh, the recordings, where I talk about, uh, you know, exactly how I get into trades on some of my strategies, uh, how I get out of trades, uh, et cetera. So that is going to be, a, a, you know, an ongoing theme where, I'm, uh, where I will be talking about strategies and uh, getting in, getting out. But uh, essentially this ongoing uh, series is, is provided to help you create your own strategies, okay? So I'm going to give some examples of my own strategies, but I'm also going to be giving you such softer topics as what we're going to be talking about today, which is uh, emotions and trading psychology, uh, money management, etc. So if you are interested in, uh, you know, purely in the concrete entry and exits uh, type of uh, strategies, then, uh, you know, you could certainly find them throughout uh, these webinars. But, uh, you know, along the way, we're also going to be talk about, uh, talking about a lot of other important aspects of your trading. 
So with that being said, uh, for this uh, uh, series of webinars, uh, you know, we talked about many different topics. Uh, we started off with an introduction to trading. We went into uh, indicators, uh, chart patterns, and then we talked about multiple time frames. And that's, uh, that was one of my uh, webinars where I talked about a concrete strategy uh, where I had uh, entries and exits, etc. Um, we talked about uh, the, uh, the week before last, we talked about trade entries, uh, about how to uh, enter in on breakouts uh, after your strategy has given you the indication that uh, you know you should probably enter into a trade then we would trigger we would be triggered into trades based upon uh, market breakouts uh, and then last week we talked about uh, setting stop losses and profit targets very very important uh, that was a very good one good one if you missed it uh, you could always go back again to our uh, to our website at cityindex.co.uk to take a look at um, you know exactly how we uh, we talk about exiting trades, how we uh, get out uh, for you know for a profit or uh, at a loss, and then of course today we're going to be talking about emotions and trading psychology, and along with that, as I just mentioned in the beginning, I'm going to be adding some uh, st strategic components as well as talking about money management. So all very very important aspects. Of your trading. Next week, we're going to be talking about trading plan discipline. I'm going to give you uh, examples of um, you know the exact trading plan that I use on a daily basis and how to put together uh, a trading plan and how to uh, you know uh, foster the discipline to follow your trading plan. Uh, and then we're going to get into more strategic aspects of trading, including uh, candlestick analysis. And then we're going to go into Fibonacci trading. Uh, trading with support and resistance, trading with the trend, counter trend and range trading, and uh, much, much more. So, uh, you know, everything's going to be really covered here. You know, after this series that you see right here, uh, you know, this is, uh, again, it's an ongoing series, so we're going to be talking about a lot of uh, different subjects going forward, even after the last one that's listed here. So uh, rest assured, there's going to be a lot of information there, and again, it's all going to be accessible on our website um, as recordings, okay? Okay, so again, uh, if you have any questions during the course of this uh, this webinar, please feel free to type them into the questions window. Okay, so basically what we, uh, you know, what we want to, or what I want to talk about today is, uh, you know, w the main focus is on emotions and trading psychology, so, you know, aspects of your trading that most uh, traders uh, really tend to disregard and uh, they shouldn't because it's extremely important uh, in trading. Once you get beyond the beginning, um, the beginning uh, stages of trading where you're always just, uh, you know, looking at uh, entries and exits and, you know, how, to, how do I get into a trade, how do I get out of a trade, etc. Once you be, uh, go beyond those beginning stages, you're going to want to uh, know a little bit more about how traders actually become successful. And a big part of this is uh, emotions and trading psychology. Okay. Now, uh, beyond that, though, uh, let me first talk about uh, some very important aspects of uh, you know, how I put together my strategies. And a lot of you have uh, been, uh, you know, have asked me this in the past, like, what, how do I exactly develop the strategies that I use? Uh, how can you develop the strategies that uh, you're going to be using? Well, the, you know, the most important thing here is that you really have to uh, test everything that you do. So uh, it's, it's less about listening to some talking head, you know, uh, talk about uh, what strategy they, they've been using to, to make money in the past. It's more about taking, you know, whatever's available to you and then actually testing it and seeing, testing it on different markets and seeing if it works for you. And once you found that formula, okay, and this formula could change over time, but once you found a formula that works for your, uh, for the markets you trade, for your style of trading, then uh, you could run with it. But only after you've tested it and fully uh, judged it according to its uh, merits or, or disadvantages. Okay. So uh, that being said, uh, I, will, uh, I will be talking about the trading psychology in a moment. I'm going to first start out with a strategic aspect, and then I'm going to go into money management, and then I'm going to be talking about uh, emotions and trading psychology, and then I'm going to be showing you my charts. Okay, so let's get started real quick. Um, one thing that uh, a lot of people ask me about um, is Confluence, because I'm always talking about it, 
and I may talk about it too much, but there's a reason for that. Confluence is uh, probably the most uh, important aspect of the way I trade from a strategic perspective, okay? This is aside from the trading psychology, aside from the money management, et cetera. This is, uh, this is about uh, how I create my strategies. And most of the time, it has to uh, do with the underlying, uh, the underlying um, you know, idea of confluence. So what exactly is confluence? Well, confluence is agreement. Uh, agreement or confirmation. It could be among many different things. Okay, so I talked about multiple time frames uh, a while back, several weeks ago. The, uh, I showed one of the strategies that I use from a multiple time frame perspective. Again, if you haven't seen that, you could go to our website and take a look at the recording. Uh, which is always available to you. Now, uh, but confluence is not just about agreement among time frames. It's also about agreement among uh, different technical tools that you have. For example, support and resistance, Fibonacci levels, chart patterns, uh, moving averages. Okay, uh, you have also indicators that you may use. Bollinger bands, people talk about a lot. Uh, I don't use that as much as uh, some people do, but uh, Bollinger bands is another uh, tool that you could use. There are many different tools they could use, and basically what Confluence is is an agreement amongst your different tools telling you that, you know, this is a high probability trade to take, okay? So whether it be, uh, you know, agreement among different time frames. So, for example, I talked about the, uh, the multiple time frames. When we had three different time frames, and in, the, in that particular strategy, what I was talking about was agreement between or among uh, three different time frames, which included the uh, the four hour time frame, the one hour time frame, and the fifteen minute time frame. Okay, if all of those three different time frames are agreeing that uh, this chart or this market is looking bullish, then perhaps you know that's a good uh, that's a good confirmation that this. Uh, market is in fact looking bullish, and at that point you can make a decision on on uh, you know taking a trade. So uh, you know if you if you recall back to the multiple time frame strategy I talked about on the long term time frame you're looking for uh, you know for example for an uptrend, and then on the middle time frame you're looking for after a pullback you're looking for recovery of the pullback going back to the upside, and then on the short term time frame you're looking for a breakout to the upside. So all three of these different time frames are all showing uh, an upside bias. And at that point, it's a, it's a higher probability to trade than if you're just looking at one time frame and you're taking a trigger based on that one time frame. Okay? Same thing with uh, the different technical tools. So, for example, if you, have a, um, if you have a, let's take a look here real quick. Uh, I know I show this euro dollar chart a lot uh, because I do trade the euro dollar a lot. And uh, this is a daily chart. And, uh, you know, another, an, another person asked me uh, recently, uh, you know, um, why am I always, always showing these daily charts? And I, I know a lot of you may be wondering that. But, you know, the reason that I'm showing these daily charts all the time is because I do most of my analysis on the daily chart. It, it is my big picture sh uh, chart. Okay, I'm not necessarily taking trades on these charts. I'm showing the big picture. And I do uh, almost all of my, uh, you know, analysis that you see on our website on, our da on the daily charts of the different markets because it's the big picture, um, it's the big picture, uh, you know, chart, time frame. Uh, now, that being said, uh, most of the time I'm going to be drilling down into shorter term time frames, but, you know, for purposes of showing examples, for purposes of showing the big picture analysis, I will be showing daily charts most of the time. Okay, and as you uh, may have noticed on the multiple time frame trading uh, that I showed a couple of weeks ago, uh, we talked about uh, you know the four hour, one hour, and fifteen minute chart. And so again, for my uh, for my daily strategies that I use for trading, I'm going to be using usually shorter term charts. Okay, that being said, let's take a look at uh, in terms of confluence. Um, the confluence of different technical tools I talked about. Uh, we have all these different lines here. I know this looks confusing, but uh, these are support and resistance lines, and they're very, you know, th they can be very, very useful uh, when used in your trading. So support and resistance are among the most important um, elements of my uh, trading, important tools of my trading, okay? So uh, besides the trend, we look at uh, support and resistance. Resistance is simply a ceiling. Support is a floor. 
and uh, we look uh, to those, and we look at for a combination of those. So, for example, if we have a moving average, uh, a key moving average, for example, is 50-day 50, 50 moving average here, and that conforms to a uh, resistance line, let's say, okay? That's a confluence of two different tools telling you that there's strong resistance there, okay? So in this particular case, uh, you know, just to show you a, an example here, I have this triangle pattern. This is a rather large triangle pattern or a pennant pattern, whatever you want to call it. And we have the 50-day moving average, which has acted as extremely good uh, resistance uh, throughout the course of this downtrend on euro dollar. Okay, so that when you when you couple that with resistance levels like the 111 level on uh, on euro dollar and also this triangle pattern you've got a confluence of resistance there telling you that perhaps there's a limit to the upside and we're looking to the downside for, to continue this downtrend in euro dollar so actually you know just as a side note what I'm looking for right now is a breakdown uh, below the 108 level which is uh, you know happened slightly and uh, looking back down towards the 105 target and if, you, uh, if you've uh, read any of my analysis in the past um, many uh, weeks and months, I've been talking about the 105 uh, target for quite some time. So, you know, just to get back to this, um, this uh, uh, subject here, uh, we're talking about confluence. So, you know, again, you have confluence of time frames. You've got a confluence of technical tools like, like what I just mentioned, the, uh, uh, the moving average, the, um, the trend lines, the support and resistance levels, the chart patterns, uh, you know, it could be indicators, um, divergences, many, many different um, aspects of uh, confluence. Now, where possible, we look for areas where more than one factor provide rationale for a trade entry or exit. So again, uh, if we're looking at different time frames, that's one way we could do it. So we're, if we're looking at different time frames, we're, we're seeing them all line up to the upside, let's say, and then that for me is a higher probability indication that uh, this market is going to the upside. Um, and then if it doesn't, which is fine, which happens, then we're going to have our risk management to take care of us. Okay. Now, uh, at the same time, if we have, uh, if we have, for example, uh, you know, different, uh, let's say right here, we have this resistance up here at 111. We also have this uh, downtrend, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, moving average right here. We also have a, um, uh, let's say, a Fibonacci level right there. Then at that point, I'm going to say, you know, this looks like very strong resistance. If it starts moving to the downside, I'm going to be looking to the downside to make my trade. Okay, so uh, the more rationale there, you know, what is confluence? The more rationale there is for a trade, the higher probability that trade will tend to be. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. So if you have different tools and or different time frames showing you that this is all going to the downside or it looks to be all going to the downside, then that trade will tend to be a higher probability trade and that's, uh, you know, and that's where I'm going to be looking to go. Okay, now uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how I create my strategies and I've got many, many strategies, uh, some of which I've shown in the past and uh, others of which I'm going to be showing uh, in uh, these future webinars in future weeks. But, uh, you know, how do I create my strategies? It's based upon this principle of confluence, okay? It's based upon several things, but confluence is one of the main ones. Uh, you know, uh, so we talked about last week and many weeks before about, um, about the TPB strategy or the TPB um, uh, principle, which is trend pullback breakout. That's one of the principles I use. Uh, when creating concrete strategies. Confluence is another one, okay? Um, so uh, TPB, confluence, and I have many other uh, principles that come together to form my concrete strategies, which, again, I'll be going through uh, in the weeks to come. Okay, so confluence should influence your decision on whether to make a trade or not, the direction of the trade, the timing of the trade, and the price entry exit of the trade. So confluence should dictate a lot of things, okay? So first of all, it should, you should ask yourself, you know, is, is this confluence showing me that a trade should be made at all? Is there a trend at all? Okay, is there, uh, is there momentum at all? Are there any fundamental factors uh, involved in this trade? Okay, the direction of the trade, this, this is very simple, whether long or short. Um, you know, the timing of the trade, when should I get into this trade, when should I get out of this trade? And uh, the price level of the entries or exits of the trade, okay? 
Now, okay, so I'm going to talk about the different confluence factors I use, okay, which includes timeframes, which includes the different tools uh, that I've been talking about for many weeks and actually many years I've been talking about these different uh, tools, okay. Now, confluence factor number one. First of all, you want to ask yourself, is there a trend? Okay, if there's no trend, usually I'm going to say there's no trade, and I'm not going to uh, I'm not even going to look at this market. There are many other markets to look at. If there is a trend, which direction is the trend going? Okay, so that's number one. So I want that on my side. So basically, confluence is you're putting together the different edges that you have with your tools, uh, with your tools and your analysis. Okay, so uh, you know number one, you want to see if there's a trend. If the trend is in your uh, direction then uh, at that point you could consider taking a trade, but you're also going to, uh, or you should also wait for other confluence factors, okay? Confluence factor number two, what is the speed or volatility of this trend? Okay, so we, so for example, uh, we see on, uh, on dollar yen, okay, and I just happen to have the currency pairs open here, so dollar yen, you know, uh, at some points, this is unmistakably an uptrend on dollar yen for a long time. At the same time, though, what is the speed and volatility of this trend? So during this time right here, as we can see right here, we see a very fast, very strong trend. Okay. Now, uh, that is, those are usually the best places to get into uh, trades when we have volatility, when we have speed of, uh, of a trend. Now, when there's consolidation, as we see here, we're still within an uptrend. Okay, I mean, we could, we could look at this, we could pretend it's a, an hour chart, uh, hourly chart, or 15-minute chart, or what have you, but it's the same uh, principle here. If, if we're in a consolidation, there really isn't uh, a lot of opportunity to get on this trend. We're still in an uptrend here, and to this day, we're still in an uptrend on dollar-yen from a longer-term perspective, but is this the best place to get in with this choppiness, with this uh, uh, range trading, with this consolidation that we're seeing? I would say not really, okay? So uh, at this point, we're looking for some type of a breakout to get into um, a possible uh, uptrend trade. But, you know, there are times when you see the speed and volatility that are very conducive to trading, okay? So confluence factor number two, what is the speed or volatility of this trend? Okay, uh, Sebastian, uh, uh, suppose you have a support at, at $4. Do you put your buy at $4 or 3.9? Or I mean, 390 or 410. Okay, uh, that's going to depend on a lot of things. That's a good question there. That's a very concrete, specific question. Suppose you have a support at four dollars. Do you put your buy at four dollars or three three ninety or four ten? It really depends on a lot of things. Okay, it depends on your strategy. Now, uh, if you are, for example, trading a breakout, and uh, uh, well, uh, at this point, if you have support at four, I'm assuming you're saying if price goes down to four. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to wait for uh, that level to be reached, uh, and then I'm going to uh, I'm going to be looking for uh, a recovery of that move to the downside to four dollars, and then I'm going to be looking uh, slightly higher than four dollars. So I would say in this particular case I would put it at four ten as opposed to four dollars, or th or three ninety. Okay, I'm probably not going to wait till it uh, dips under support. Okay, if it does go under support, then at that point I'm probably not even going to take the trade. Okay, because uh, if there's a breakout, then at that point I might not. Yes, uh, if 3.9, 3.90 is risky because it may be broken. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, that's confluence factor number two. Confluence factor number three, do multiple time frames confirm this trend? Okay, so first of all, we're looking for if there's a trend. Second of all, we're looking for speed or volatility of this trend. And third, are the different time frames that you're looking at confirming this trend? Okay, four, is the trend pulling back or in correction or consolidation? Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, trend pullback breakout, TPB, and we're always, or at least I'm always looking for some type of a consolidation before a breakout in the direction of the trend. Number five, what are the major and minor support and resistance levels? Where are the major and minor support and resistance levels? Whenever you're trading, you always want to know exactly where uh, the major and minor support and resistance levels are. So, for example, you know, even though let's say I'm trading on the five-minute chart, even if that's the case, I want to know that this 122 level on dollar yen is a very strong resistance level on the daily chart. Let's go to another chart here just to make it a little bit clearer. Um, 
So, uh, you know, you have your major, uh, what's the difference between a major and a minor support or resistance level? The major, uh, simply speaking, the major uh, ones are the ones that you see on the larger time frames, okay, the major turning points. So, for example, here we see the major turning point at, uh, at one, I'm sorry, let me take a look here, 111 right here, okay, so 111 is a very strong uh, support and resistance, now it's a resistance level on Euro dollar. 105 was also very strong, okay, 108 back in time was also very strong. So uh, if we have all of these support and resistance levels in mind, even though we're, we're trading on the lower term time frames, okay, we want to know where the major uh, support and resistance levels are because those can uh, present a barrier to your uh, uh, to your strategy, to your uh, direction, to your trade. Okay, so we want to know where the major and also the minor support and resistance levels. If you're on, let's say, if you're trading the five-minute chart, you want to know where the major ones are, the major support and resistance levels are. But of course, you also want to know where the minor ones are, the ones that are showing up on the five-minute uh, chart itself. Okay, uh, number six, where are the major moving averages? As I uh, just mentioned, moving averages can be extremely helpful in showing you uh, support and resistance. So as we see here, uh, you know, this move up on euro dollar, uh, it, got, uh, it, it, it got rejected right around this 50-day moving average. Also up here, also up here, also to a certain extent up here, okay? So during the course of this entire run to the downside, this 50-day moving average worked very well as uh, resistance, okay? Here we see uh, the uh, pound dollar, okay? The pound dollar here is, as you can see, very strong resistance all the way until it's broken to the upside and then broken back to the downside. And then once again as resistance, I'm looking to the downside on pound dollar, but as we can see here, very strong resistance here as well with the 50-day moving average, okay? Um, okay, same, same type of thing here with the uh, Aussie dollar, okay? So during the course of this entire run to the downside, very nice uh, resistance here in, uh, with the exception of that pop to the upside that just occurred in, uh, in, in uh, late March, okay? So uh, back to this, so where are the major moving averages? That also helps with your, uh, with your confluence, with your decision to make a trade, okay? And then are there any key ch uh, chart patterns showing? I just showed you that uh, large triangle pattern on euro dollar. You want to know if there are any key chart patterns showing in conjunction with all these other factors. Uh, are there any key candlestick patterns showing? I talked uh, a while ago, and, and uh, actually it's going to be two weeks from now, I'm going to be talking about uh, all about candlesticks. But I often mention candlesticks because they are very good adjunct tools, okay, tools that you use uh, in conjunction with everything else that you use. So uh, I, gave the, uh, I always give the example of the shooting star and the, um, and the uh, hammer candle because they're, they're very good at telling the story of rejection at a support or resistance level and therefore possibly a bounce. Um, so, uh, you know, you use those in conjunction with your other tools, and they can be very, very strong uh, indicators. Okay, and then number nine is, uh, are other useful indicators supporting this trade? So basically, I'm going through this whole checklist, okay? And I'm not actually, you know, I don't actually have this checklist in front of me, uh, you know, and, and saying, uh, is there a trend, uh, you know, what's the speed of this trend, etc. You know, I've done this for so long that this has been ingrained in me, and, you know, and this, as a beginner trader, if you're a beginner trader, you should really uh, try to ingrain these types of questions into your trading. Like, is there a trend? You know, what's the speed of this trend? Uh, do, you know, what's confirming this trend? Are the, uh, are the different support and resistance levels confirming it? Are major moving averages or ch uh, chart patterns or candles candlestick patterns confirming uh, this, um, uh, this move or this potential trade? If so, then I'm going to be looking at, uh, at it as a potential high probability trade, and then uh, I'm probably going to get into this trade, okay? And again, confluence is uh, one of the key elements that underlies my, develop, my strategy development. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, and I'm going to be showing you a bunch of strategies in the coming weeks, uh, showing you exactly, you know, how I get into trades, how I get out of trades, but underlying all of that are a couple of different principles, including confluence, including the TPB principle, trend pullback breakout. Okay, so that's the strategic aspect of this.
Let's move on to uh, money management. And I know a lot of you probably don't want to hear this, but uh, this is uh, extremely important. And you know, less of, even less of, uh, of you want to hear about uh, trading psychology and uh, emotions, I'm guessing. But uh, again, extremely important aspects of your trading. Um, so let's get to that real quick. Uh, Okay, Hassan, uh, how much time do you think a beginner should give to the financial market to become a professional trader despite, uh, despite the fact that they have other commitments? Okay, um, yeah, I mean, everyone has other commitments. Uh, but if you really want to be successful at anything, I think, uh, I think you really, need to, uh, you really need to spend some time at least learning it. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you, want to, if you want to be successful at uh, something like trading, it can be difficult. If you want to be a, a consistently successful trader, if you want to do this, uh, you know, even as a, as a job, if you want to do this on a full-time basis, uh, it's going to take a commitment uh, in, in learning and a commitment in, in, uh, in developing yourself in many ways, okay, including strategy development. So, um, you know, to answer that question, uh, I think... Uh, I think you should, uh, if you're a beginner, you know, of course you should, uh, you should use the demo account uh, to, uh, to test out your trades. Uh, you could open a small account if you'd like to, to get started, but in terms of how much time you should spend, uh, you know, it depends on how much time you have, but if you really want to be successful at, at it, uh, it does require commitment. Um, Andy, uh, if a high impact news release is due and many confluent factors have come together on my chart, do I still take the trade? Okay, that's a great question, Andy. If a high impact news release is due and many confluent factors have come together on my chart, do I still take the trade? That's a question that, uh, that you have to answer for yourself. Uh, the way I would answer it is uh, no, I would not. Okay? I would not. Because, why? Because uh, high impact news releases prompt the technicals which uh, is basically what I'm talking about here, the technicals to basically go out the window, okay? So, uh, you know, oftentimes you'll have big news releases, whether it be the non-farm non -farm payrolls release in the U.S. or um, any central bank, uh, you know, uh, central bank uh, yeah, meeting or announcement or what have you, uh, you know, those tend to make the markets uh, move, you know, without much... Uh, without much rhyme or reason. So, uh, you know, that being said, uh, I am primarily a technical trader. If I, knew, if I know there's a scheduled news release to come out, um, I'm probably not going to take the trade, okay? However the strong, strong the trade may be, I'm probably not going to take it out. If it's, take out, you know, take the trade if it's right before, uh, right before a news release, okay? If a news release occurs during the course of a trade, there's not much uh, that I could do except protect my position. Okay, with uh, with my risk management, and we talked about that last week. So, a uh, very good question there. Will, ten thousand hours. I'm assuming you're talking about how much time you need to commit to uh, to this. Um, yeah, ten. Why not ten thousand hours? Uh, Brian, are all these techniques just as relevant to equities as FX and indices? Yes, absolutely. Would you recommend looking at just a small number, um, a small number of them? Uh, I'm not sure what I mean by small. What you mean by small number? But uh, yes, uh, these techniques are uh, as relevant to equities as FX and indices. I trade. What I trade is uh, essentially uh, FX, indices, individual stocks, and uh, commodities. Okay, so I pretty much trade everything uh, out there. And uh, for the most part, while my strategies may uh, my my you know, precise strategies may not all be the same for these different markets. The principles underlying these strategies are the same. Okay, so I talk about confluence. I talk about uh, uh, trend pullback breakout. Those are all the same. Okay, where they differ is uh, you know some uh, uh, different markets have different uh, characteristics. For example, uh, the uh, currency market, uh, as I as I talked about in the beginning of the series many weeks ago, is uh, the currency markets are biased to the upside or to the downside. They don't have a general bias to the upside, okay, uh, because of the fact that they're trading in pairs. Uh, but that being said, you know, they're different, uh, they're different strategies uh, being used for different uh, markets, but the underlying principles are the same, okay. Uh, Brian, small number of equities, okay, so uh, 
Would you recommend looking at just a small number of equities? You know, I look at a lot of equities. I'm always looking for uh, opportunities. So, uh, you know, I, I look at, I have a, I have a pretty big list of, uh, on my watch list in terms of what I'm looking at. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I have several different, uh, currency pairs. I have several different, uh, indices. I also have, uh, commodities, uh, including gold and, uh, and crude oil, uh, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, but also, uh, I have, uh, I have, uh, you know, a lot of different, uh, uh, equities which include, uh, you know, mostly U.S. equities, but also U.K. equities. Uh, and, uh, you know, I look at them for opportunities. So, uh, you know, as many opportunities as I could find. If, if they, you know, if, if I find a high probability opportunity, I'm going to take it, whatever market it's on. Okay. Sebastian, how profitable are you? I mean, is it 10% up a month, 10% up a year, or is it a day? Okay, so I can't really talk about uh, profitability or... Um, or results uh, in a public forum like this, but uh, for me, uh, generally speaking, it's uh, more. I'm looking for longer-term growth. Now, if you're talking about 10 10 uh, percent up a month, that's a lot. And if any, if anyone's getting consistently 10 percent up a month, um, you know, it's it's very difficult to keep that uh, consistently up. Okay, uh, that uh, that usually means that you're t you're taking inordinate uh, risk, and at that point, uh, it's very difficult to keep up a consistent uh, profit level of that uh, you know of that level. Um, what we're more talking about is along the lines of uh, you know twenty to thirty you know or maybe more percent uh, per, uh, per per year. Okay, so ten percent a month is difficult. Um, I know a lot of a lot of you may be looking for that type of thing, but uh, you know, realistically speaking, the best money managers in the world are not making anywhere near that. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's uh, let's go. Uh, does commitment mean? Well, that being said, you know, uh, the, you know, that being said, that uh, the best money managers in the world are not making near that. It's because that they're taking less risk, that, you know, they, they understand the risk involved. A lot of uh, beginning traders think that, you know, they can make those types of returns because, you know, they're taking uh, a very large risk. Now, uh, over time, they'll find out that this, uh, taking that type of risk is uh, unsustainable, okay, is, is usually unsustainable. I, I have yet to see someone making that kind of return without blowing up at some point or another. Okay, and the reason that uh, many of us uh, professional traders have not blown up is because we we uh, pay attention to such things as money management and risk management. Okay, but that being said, also, uh, you know, this is all scalable. So if you're making uh, twenty, thirty percent per year on on a small account, you could do just the same on a larger account. So uh, you know, it's it's very scalable to the upside. Okay. Um, Robert does, okay, let me just take a look. I know I'm answering a lot of questions here, but, uh, let me, uh, get to, after this question, let me get to, uh, back to the money management. Does commitment mean looking at your charts 100% of the time while you're trading, or do you think it's okay to be doing something else on your computer at the same time and maybe only looking at your charts every 15 minutes, say, if you're day trading? Okay, that's a, <clears throat> that's a very good question, uh, question there. Uh, does it mean looking at your charts 100% of the time? I don't do that, okay? I'm, I'm looking, you know, I'm, I don't look at my charts 100% of the time. Actually, I, you know, I always have an eye on my charts, but I'm not, uh, I'm not concentrating on them 100% of the time during the course of the day. Then again, I'm not a day trader. If you're a day trader, you're probably going to, and you're looking for opportunities during the day, you're probably going to be looking at your charts a lot, okay? If you're a, a, a more of a swing trader, uh, or a uh, or a longer term position trader, you're probably going to be looking at your your charts uh, uh, much less, uh, like I do. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of questions here. I'm sorry. Uh, let me just uh, I'll, I'll try to get to those uh, towards the end. Let me just go through money management real quick, uh, and then trading psychology. Money management is uh, is based on risk management. Okay, this is very important. And a lot, you know, judging from the questions that people ask me on a regular basis, uh, people don't really care about this topic. But uh, you know, you really should care about this topic. It, it's it's really not about um, 
anything else but this topic. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, money management. It's based on risk management, and uh, it's all about doing all you can to make your account number one survive and number two thr thrive over the long run. I just talked about people blowing up, and I've seen so many people blowing up. And when I say blowing up, I mean losing their entire account because they thought they can make uh, make um, you know ten ten percent a, a day, or I mean I'm sorry, ten percent a month or even 10% a week or a day, you know, some people have unrealistic expectations. And when you have those unrealistic expectations, you tend to blow up your account because you're taking risks that, that are beyond, uh, you know, the risks that you should be taking. So, uh, you know, money management is extremely important because, number one, we do want to survive, okay, especially while we're learning. We don't want to lose all our money while we're learning. And then, uh, you know, and then not be able to, and then go on to something else, okay? We want to be, we want to survive, first of all. And number two, we want to thrive, which means we want to make money. Ultimately, that's what we want to do. Now, uh, so what are the elements of money management? Number one, position sizing, okay? You need to position your size, uh, you need to size your position, I'm sorry, size your position according to the size of your account, Okay, you don't want to be taking big positions. I know you want to make, be making 10% a day. Everyone does. But uh, to size your positions that way means that you could also lose, you know, uh, uh, lose a lot. You could lose 10% of your account in a day, or you could lose your whole uh, your whole account in, in in a day, or or in a couple of days. Okay, so position sizing is is extremely important. I'm going to be talking about this uh, more in the weeks to come. But just know that um, uh, the the size of your position. And we talked a little bit about this uh, last week. Uh, someone asked me, uh, you know, how much risk are you willing to take on on a on a given trade, on one given trade? Well, I, I talked about two percent, and then I talked about uh, professional traders and institutional traders, uh, you know, having risk much less than two percent of their account for every given trade. Um, so if you think along those lines, you want to be able to survive and trade another day. You want to uh, size your positions accordingly. And, uh, you know, a good kind li guideline, I think, would be uh, having each trade, you know, the maximum, your maximum loss on each trade to be 1% to 2%, okay? Now, uh, number two, uh, being familiar with margin and leverage. You, you need to know, especially if you're trading CFDs or uh, spread betting or, you know, uh, FX or any of the stuff, you need to be familiar with how the margin and the leverage affect your account, okay? If you have any questions about that, Please feel free to contact uh, you know our our office in London. They'll be more than happy to uh, talk to you about you know how to uh, how to deal with margin and leverage, what it means, and you know how it affects your account. Number three, maximum allowable loss per trade. What I just talked about, which is very uh, tied very closely to position sizing. Okay, so you want to uh, make sure that your maximum allowable loss per trade. And I would say is no more than two percent. Okay, you want to have smaller trades, if which means that if you have a ten thousand uh, pound account, you don't want your uh, uh, loss on any given trade to exceed two hundred pounds. Okay, and this is for uh, an individual trade. So you can have several trades open, um, but uh, you know I would say uh, you know don't don't uh, exceed that amount. And you know I would say even go lower than that, especially if you want to uh, if you want to really watch your risk well. Okay, risk reward ratio. We talked about this a lot last week. Uh, this means uh, you know how much your reward, your profit, is uh, you know when compared to your risk. So I talked about if you're if you're position trading, you want to have a larger uh, uh, you know much larger reward than than your risk. Uh, if you're short term uh, intraday trading, then maybe it could be closer to one to one. But at the same time, you should always uh, keep this in mind when you are managing your money, when you're managing your account. Okay, you want to lock in profits. We talked about this last week. Uh, when you're trading, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes you want to run with a trade, but um, at the same time, while you're running with a trade that's going in your favor, you're gonna or you should want to lock in your profits. Where uh, if the market just does a complete reversal on you, it doesn't. Uh, you don't end up with a loss. Okay, at least you locked in some of your profits. Okay, and then uh, um, um, money management element number six. Uh, risk control through automated stop loss, and uh, you know, I, I again, I talked about this last week. Uh, we don't want to have, uh, we probably don't want to have mental stop losses because they 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 uh, require a lot of discipline. 
to have mental stop losses where you actually just say, okay, this is where I'm going to uh, get out of the trade, as opposed to putting in an automated stop loss on your platform. I recommend putting in automated stop losses because most of us, me included, uh, lack the discipline to get out uh, oftentimes when uh, price is going against us, okay? Um, number seven, daily and weekly loss limits, okay? So if you're losing a lot, if you're on a losing streak on your trades, then uh, you're going to want to, uh, you know, limit your losses, okay? And so, again, so you could survive and thrive or survive to, to trade another day, okay? So uh, daily and weekly loss limits, if you're losing a lot today, you know, rather than try to play catch up and try to uh, make back from the market what you lost, um, maybe it's time to, to uh, you know, to close down for the day, okay? Um, now, number eight, trade diversification. You want to diversify, especially if you're putting in different or, or you know, many various uh, trades. You want to diversify what you're getting into because oftentimes if you're getting into very correlated markets, okay, let's say you're going um, – Let's say you're going long uh, euro dollar, you're going long uh, pound dollar, and you're going long Aussie dollar, okay, at the same time. What does that mean? Basically, that means you're in a short dollar position. So, so that's almost like one big position, okay? It's not exactly, of course, but it's almost like one big position because you're, you're shorting the, uh, the uh, U.S. dollar. And uh, that's why we want to trade, uh, we want to diversify our trades uh, into uh, preferably okay can you hear me okay okay sorry about that not sure what just happened there um, okay so uh, trade diversification um, yeah, not sure what just happened there. Okay, uh, trade diversification, and then we talk about uh, resisting gambling and targeting uh, longevity. Okay, so we, we don't want to be uh, trading. We don't want, we don't want to be gambling and uh, just putting in trades just because we feel like putting in trades. Okay, uh, finally, let's get to uh, trading psychology and emotional pitfalls. Uh, I know this was the main uh, subject of today's webinar, but uh, uh, I kept it to the last. Okay, so. Um, Trading psychology and emotional pitfalls. Trading psychology, as I keep mentioning, is a major element of trading. Okay, so you have to, uh, you have to really. Okay, here, I'm just trying to deal with the audio. I'm not sure why that happened. Okay, so uh, when we, you know, we all succumb to such emotions as hope, fear, and greed, as well as desiring vengeance and needing to be right. Very, very important that we uh, that we refrain from doing so, okay? Uh, and th this is a little bit uh, literary here, but markets are battlefields littered with defeated traders who allowed themselves to succumb to negative emotions. Okay, I actually wrote that. Um, I don't know if it's a little too flowery there, but uh, okay, so let's talk about the emotional pitfalls. Now, number one, uh, we talk about hoping and praying. Okay. Okay, sorry, just uh, trying to deal some, with some technical issues here. Okay, so uh, uh, pitfall number one, hoping and praying, especially when the market goes against you. So how many times have you found yourself in the situation where, uh, you know, first of all, maybe you don't have a stop loss on, you get into a trade, you get in long, and then uh, price goes against you, and then, uh, you know, it keeps going against you, and at that point you're hoping and praying that at some point it goes back in your favor because you don't want to cut, uh, cut your loss at that point. Uh, the loss is getting too big, and it's just getting bigger by the minute. Um, at that point, you're hoping and praying. Now, uh, really, you should never get into this position. Uh, you know, hoping and praying, uh, you know, usually does not work. So if you're sitting there trying to uh, wish the, uh, uh, the market to go back in your direction, um, you know, it's, it's uh, usually a losing game. So how do you, uh, how do you, um, how do you deal with that type of uh, um that type of a situation. Well, basically, you need to have your risk management in place. Okay, so uh, if if price goes against you and losses, you know, are part of trading, 
if price goes against you, if your trade goes against you, uh, you know, the best uh, remedy for that is to have risk management in place. Pitfall number two, fear of pulling the trigger, particularly when experiencing a losing trade or string of losses. Okay, so, uh, you know, people tend to get gun shy. Uh, once, if, if you are able to follow your, your strategy, if you've tested your strategy, it works, and, uh, you know, and you have a string of losses, those should be an expected part of your trading, okay? So, uh, you know, once that occurs, a lot of people may feel, okay, this is maybe not the, uh, the strategy, uh, the strategy is not working, and therefore I'm not going to pull the trigger according to my tested strategy. Well, you know, if a, if a strategy doesn't work over a long period of time, at that point, uh, you should probably reevaluate. But, uh, you know, losses are a part of trading, and they should be a part, uh, you know, they should be an expected part of every trading strategy. So just the fact that you're experiencing uh, losses should not dissuade you from, uh, you know, making, um, from making trades. Pitfall number three, overtrading or unwilling to take profits because of greed for more. Okay, so I've seen this many, many times. Uh, people uh, start getting uh, maybe overconfident uh, and they start uh, trading too much or, uh, you know, they're in trades and then, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, they, they don't want to take the, their profits off the table because they think this is going to, uh, you know, this uh, market's going to go on forever. Now, that usually doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, all of these pitfalls that I'm talking about here can be remedied with just following your trading plan. And, again, I'm going to be talking about this next week, uh, the discipline to follow a trading plan. Pitfall number four, overtrading after losses because of the desire to get back at the markets or to make up for losses. This is what I just talked about uh, with regard to, uh, you know, uh, having a set daily loss limit or a set weekly loss limit. Once you get to a certain point, you know, a lot of traders think, okay, I want to, uh, you know, at this point I, I lost a lot of money. I want to get back at the markets. I want to make up for my losses. You know, I can make up for this, uh, uh, for this several thousand pound uh, loss today by, uh, you know, and uh, turning it, turn it into a profit. Well, usually that type of trading is conducive to losing even more money, okay, because, uh, you know, this is emotional trading. So that is uh, another very big pitfall that many people get lost in. Uh, pitfall number five, unwillingness to close trades because of the need to be right, okay. So this is, uh, um, you know, and this is especially when the price goes against you, when your trade goes against you you're often unwilling, you don't want to close the trade because uh, you think uh, at the, some point this is going to turn around. Case in point, we talk about the, uh, uh, talk about crude oil, okay? So a lot of people thought, okay, so it, it you know, it, it went down and then it keeps going down and people are thinking, okay, there must be a, a bottom at some point, but I'm going to stay long, on, on, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get in long because it's, it's gone too low and then, uh, you know, at some point it's going to turn around and then it keeps going down. And from there, it keeps going down, and, and just like we see right now with crude oil, uh, today I believe it went down by another 6 or 7%, at least this is the U.S. Uh, WTI crude. Um, but basically, uh, people are thinking, uh, you know, they want to be right, and at some point this is going to turn around. Well, oftentimes it doesn't. At that point, you could turn, into, uh, you know, a small loss into a catastrophic loss. Pitfall number six, throwing all logic and strategy out the window because of emotional distress or gambling tendencies, and that I think speaks for itself. We don't want to do that. Um, so these are the, the these are the most common uh, emotional pitfalls that you find with uh, with traders, and uh, you should really uh, take heed to them and uh, try to avoid them. Uh, if you want uh, my uh, my uh, PowerPoint presentation here, uh, just because there's a lot of information here, uh, please feel free to email me, and I'd be more than happy to uh, to send you. Uh, the presentation. Okay, uh, let's get back to the questions here. Um, let me take a look here. Lots of questions today. Um, do you rank your, okay, James, Simon uh, says, James, do you rank your technical analysis and confluence equally through the trading week, i.e. Monday a.m. as against Friday p.m.? Uh, yes, uh, Simon, uh, that's a good question. Uh, do I rank my, you know, how do I use my technical analysis, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, Monday a.m. or Friday p.m.? 
uh, do I use my, uh, my analytical tools and my confluence uh, equally? And, and the, the answer is, is yes, I do. Uh, that being said, uh, I'm probably uh, going to, you know, I may uh, avoid taking a trade on a Friday p.m., okay, uh, as opposed to uh, taking a trade, you know, uh, being all ready to take a trade on Monday a.m., you know, on a Friday p.m., maybe I don't want to take that, um, take that, uh, that uh, weekend risk, okay? So uh, at that point, although I will rank the technical analysis and confluence equally during those times, I may refrain from taking a trade because it's at a different uh, time during the week. But, but, um, but generally speaking, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the charts. I'm looking at price action uh, pretty much regardless of uh, the time or day of week. But, again, you know, uh, I may be swayed not to take a trade because, for example, it's end of the day on Friday. And this is especially for, you know, stocks. Okay. Um, if you have to complete the nine different steps for confluence, don't you think there's a high probability a trader will miss an opportunity to trade? Yes, great question. This is from uh, Ada Kunle. Uh, if you have to complete the nine different steps for confluence, don't you think there's a high probability a trader will miss an opportunity to trade? Absolutely yes. So that's why I said I'm not actually looking at this list. Uh, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm providing uh, beginning traders with a list just so that they can ingrain themselves what to look for. After a little while of, of uh, looking at this uh, list of what to look for, it's going to be ingrained in you, and you're going to know what looks like a good trade, what looks like a bad trade, according to my criteria, which includes trend, okay, the different tools I have, the support and resistance, okay. So I have all this in my, in my mind already. Uh, I'm not actually looking at this list, but great question there. So as a beginner, yeah, you may have to look at a list, and you may miss some opportunities, yes. But once it's become ingrained in you, you're going to be able to, uh, to um, see or to, uh, to identify what's a good, what may be a good trade, what may be a bad trade, according to uh, this list or any list that you make up on your own. Okay, Sam, um, thanks for this brilliant lecture. How can I beat my fear to get into the trade even if the trend is very favorable? Well, that just takes practice, Sam. Uh, you know, that's a great question as well. How do I how do I beat my fear to to take the trade, even if the trend is favorable? Again, it takes practice, um, but uh, and fear of pulling the trigger is is a big thing. Okay, here. But um, what you need to do is uh, maybe you should start with smaller trades or even demo trades that that use uh, practice money uh, just to get over your fear of doing that. But then you know you can ease yourself into it. It does, you know, if you're making your first trade, it does take a lot to pull the trigger. It, it really does. If any of you remember uh, the first tra trade you you took, you know, you're probably filled with adrenaline, and uh, the first real trade you took, uh, you're probably filled with adrenaline. You're probably nervous, and you know, you're probably fearful. But uh, you know, that just takes time to overcome. And then, of course, what helps is that you have your risk management in place. You have your stop loss in place, so you know if this goes against you then you're probably going to be okay. Robert, you do have a lot of indicators. You have a lot of indicators that you can be looking at after all. Yep. Uh, I think that's a follow-up from the last question. Uh, Sebastian, and when you know almost for a fact that Euro will weaken, for example, how does this influ influence the risk that you would take? When you know almost for a fact, well, you know, I didn't really have time to go through my charts, but um, I don't know almost for a fact uh, but it can never, you can never say that, okay? It's a very dangerous thing to say when you know for a fact the euro is going to weaken. Uh, but I know for a probability that euro dollar may go down, okay? So I don't want to say for a fact, but uh, I'm looking to the downside as well, okay? So I'm looking uh, towards, uh, again, as I mentioned, 105. But uh, the question is, does this influence the risk that you would take? Um, uh, I would say you always have to keep the same uh, risk parameters in place, even if you're relatively sure, and you should never be relatively sure about anything uh, with regard to the markets because markets do crazy things, and I've been around long enough to know this. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, should that uh, influence the risk that you, you would take? I would say no, okay? Even if you're pretty sure that the euro is going to go down, that doesn't mean I'm not going to put a, a stop loss on if I'm wrong. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to absolutely keep my stop loss on, and I'm going to keep a, a pretty good one, a pretty tight one on, uh, because I know things can happen in the markets, and I don't want to be caught 
in things happening. Okay. Um, let me see. Let me just take one more before we end this. Uh, Will, what's your thoughts on taking some and move stop to break even? Does this strangle trades in your opinion? Will, very good question. Okay, what's your thoughts on taking uh, some profits and then moving stop to break even? I talked all about this last week. Okay, very good question there. Um, I, I love doing that. Okay, so I like taking profits on some, which, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, uh, t uh, putting in multiple trades, multiple positions, and then taking profits on a little bit, and then moving stop to break even, and then, uh, and then you know, going from there, and then uh, moving your, your stop higher or taking uh, further profits as the uh, trade moves further in your direction. Absolutely, I think it's a great way to trade. Uh, but at the same time, you say, does, does this strangle trades in your opinion? Uh, it could because it, you know, when you do that, oftentimes you could be uh, you could be stopped out prematurely. But uh, at the same time, I would rather I would rather lock in my profits uh, than uh, you know and and risk doing that than uh, than risk losing more. Okay. Um, okay. Lots of questions here. Sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. Uh, it is uh, it is the uh, you know my time is pretty much up here. Uh, if you have any questions that I wasn't able to answer, I apologize. Uh, there were lots of questions today and lots of material I went over. Um, again, this will be recorded and put on our website tomorrow at cityindex.co.uk. If you have any questions, please feel free free to email me, email me at james.chen at cityindex.com. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email email me there as well. And uh, you know, hopefully, you will see you next uh, next week on the webinar that we're going to be talking about trading plan discipline. Okay, so thanks a lot for all your time today, and see you next time. Thank you very much.